What's up, world? Raging Redneck coming at you again from the beautiful back hills of western Pennsylvania. Uh, we're going to have a change of pace today. Uh, normally, those of you who uh, follow me know that I'm known for my uh, witty anecdotes and uh, being funny as hell. Um, but today I decided uh, I'm going to do an informational video. All right, so no big secret. I work on heavy trucks for a living. Uh, I have done so since I think I started getting paid for it when I was like 15, 16 years old. Um, I did go through college for it. I have a degree to fix trucks. Uh, and I have a stack that looks like a miniature phone book of engine certifications from various manufacturers. Now, even though that this page is for humor, um, it still comes in my fan mail all the time. Um, you know, hey, Redneck, my truck's broke. It's doing this. What do I do? First of all, does it look like I'm at work? Well, whatever. Uh, because I'm such a helpful guy and I'm sick of getting asked, uh, I decided to make this video so maybe I can clear some of the shit up for some of you people. First things first, the acronyms are absolutely endless. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to keep up with all of them, uh, with everything that's on your truck, just because of the fact of you don't do this every day. Uh, the only reason that I do know it, uh, it's not like I am some super big brainy guy. It's just that I have to deal with it literally every single day of my life. All right, so let's take a flashback here. Uh, the year 2002, uh, I graduated high school. Everything was great. Everybody was happy. Except for, like, these dickheads like Bernie Sanders, uh, who love to bitch about everything. They decided that heavy trucks got away with way too much, way too little emissions for way too long. So they decided it was time to put EGR on heavy trucks. What is EGR? Uh, EGR stands for Exhaust Gas Recirculation. Now, contrary to the popular belief, the point of EGR is not to burn off extra fuel that's left in the exhaust. Uh, if there happens to be some uh, hydrocarbons left in the exhaust, be it if it's on a gas engine or on a diesel engine, there's a chance it could get burned off going back through the engine. But that is not the main point of it. The main point of it is, is since there isn't really a lot of oxygen left inside of exhaust gas, because it should have all been used inside the engine, um, the exhaust is actually an inert gas, meaning it will not burn. Uh, the whole point of bringing exhaust gas back into the engine is it acts as an inert gas. It's like a heat sink. It makes the engine, the actual combustion chamber temperatures are now colder because of that inert gas. Now, why would you want to do that? When you lower combustion chamber temperatures, one of the biggest uh, emissions that we have to worry about, I guess, as a people, according to what they tell us, is NOx gas, oxides of nitrous. Not like, you know, the NOS button you see in Fast and Furious, but just random oxides of nitrous floating around. They're very bad, and they do deplete the ozone layer. I can't get into all that because this video would be five hours long. So just trust me, that's what happens. Well, NOx gases are formed inside of an internal combustion engine at extremely high temperatures. So as we introduce EGR, it actually lowers combustion chamber temperatures, which then theoretically will reduce the NOx output. This is also why we have EGR coolers on diesel engines and not on gasoline engines. Because with pyrometer temperatures, the, the temperature of the exhaust gas coming out of a diesel engine is typically, uh, you know, 10 times what it will be coming out of a car. Well, if we're interjecting 1,000 degree exhaust back into the cylinder, what's that going to do for our cooling theory? Not much. That's why there are EGR coolers on diesel engines. It's to actually lower the temperature. If you're interjecting hot inert gas, you're not really going to do a whole, you're, you're going to do more for the combustion process. You'll lower temperatures that way, but not really the, the total desired effect you're going to get. That's why uh, diesel engines have a EGR cooler on them. The next thing we're going to talk about is your DPF, or diesel particulate filter commonly called the soot box or the soot filter or whatever the hell you guys want to call it out there in trucker talk. Uh, the biggest thing I can tell you about DPFs, number one, is do not believe a single word you hear over your CB about what it is, how it works, how to fix it, or how to screw with it, because none of them are right. All right, so the year was like 2007, and again, everyone's happy to got fucking EGR and heavy trucks, and that shut the Penguin Huggers up for a while. But then the Penguin Huggers decided the real problem with diesel engines is because since diesel fuel burns and creates like that sooty shit, the black shit you used to see inside the stacks or whatever. Trucks running was making the earth dirty. That was the problem. Trucks were making the earth dirty. So a bunch of assholes come up with this idea called a DPF or diesel particulate filter. And the whole point of that thing is to pull the soot out of the exhaust. There should be no 
part, hence the particulate filter part, uh, any kind of solid matter coming out of the exhaust is going to get trapped in your DPF, or at least it's supposed to. Now, every manufacturer, there are literally, I think there's 15 different things that I've heard of, of ways that DPFs work, and the type of shit that they're made out of and all that. The most common one is uh, this shit, it looks like a honeycomb, it's like a compacted uh, crystallized sand almost. Now, what do we know about crystallized sand? You crystallize enough, you get glass. What do we know about glass? It's fragile. Hint, DPFs are fragile. Do not hit them with hammers. Do not drop them. Uh, put skid plates under them if you're going to be off-roading. Bullshit like that. Now, like all filters, uh, it will plug. As a diesel engine runs, it creates soot. That's just the nature of the beast. Once that thing has enough soot in it, there are temperature and pressure sensors to see how much shit is actually getting caught inside of that. Now, once there's too much in it, what will happen is the truck will go through something called a regeneration or a regen. Now, what a lot of people don't know is babying trucks with DPFs is very, very bad. You need to beat the living shit out of them because as you're beating them, your pyro stays up. As the pyro stays up, that thing will actually regen. It'll do what's called a passive regeneration. You won't even know it's doing it. And what will happen is, is your exhaust heat just going through will burn off the soot matter that's stuck inside of it. Now, if you can't do this during a passive, if, if the truck can't complete a passive regen on its own, it will go into what's called an active regeneration. Uh, we'll go through, like, say, like the Cummins system, uh, Packar system works pretty much the same way. Uh, the way that that works is there's a catalyst called a DOC, or diesel oxidation catalyst, mounted in front of the DPF, or diesel particulate filter. Now, upstream, up right behind the turbo usually, there's this thing called an HC, or a fuel doser, or an after-treatment injector. Now, what that thing will do is, is as temperatures go up, it will start injecting a little bit of diesel fuel into the exhaust stream. It goes down, hits the DOC, and begins to glow, kind of like the way a cigarette lighter does. It doesn't actually blow a flame like people think. That's not how it works. And its sole purpose is to build heat. Okay, uh, That system, uh, under the right conditions, can build 1,200 degrees. That's a little on the hot side. You really don't want it that high. Usually 1,000 to 1,100 is right about good. And it's at 1,250, 1,300. It'll throw a check engine light for high DPF inlet temperature. But anyway, it'll build temperature, and then it starts burning the soot out of there. Now, it takes very specific conditions for all this shit to work. And if it can't reach that on its own, what it will do is call for a stationary or a, or a parked regen. They're the same thing. Uh, where you'll see the little little dum-dum light starts flashing our dash. It usually says regen required. Shows you a little symbol. It's like a bunch of dots with lines on either end with a cloud blowing through it. Okay. One of the commonly asked questions is, is when that light comes on, what do I do? Well, you pull over and you regen. It's somewhere in the cab of that truck there's going to be a start button. Uh, it's going to have that little cloud on it. It should say regeneration for start whatever. Pull over, set your parking brake, and push that button. you got to hold it usually four to seven seconds, and you'll, you'll hear the truck will usually ramp up an RPM. If it's like a cat, it'll sound like a B-52 because it turns the fan on, screams away at 1450 for a fucking hour, uh, and sit there and let it go until it's done, until you hear it idle back down. There's another common question, okay? How long can I drive it? Or like, hey, you know, like I'm halfway through my day and like I'll be shutting down tonight. Can I do it later? Or, what did I say? I didn't say any of that. I said, when that light comes on, you pull over. You start a regen. Oh, but I got a load of blacktop on and it's, it's got to go. Oh, but I ain't been home in three weeks and I'm right around the corner. Look at don't bitch at me. I didn't design it. All I can tell you is how it works. I'm here. I mean, don't shoot the messenger, okay? I am telling you how it works, and I fix these every day. When that regen light comes on, you pull over. You run a stationary regen, okay? Sometimes you got to make sure your PTO is disengaged. You got to have it neutral. If you got an automatic or an auto magic fucking shiftable, you got a, a clutchable automatic or however the hell it works, make sure it's in neutral of some kind, parking brake set, zero vehicle speed, and your engine load's got to be under 10%, so don't be running no bullshit off of it. Reach over, hold that button, run a regen. No, you can't wait till the end of the day. I don't care how hot your blacktop's got to be or any of that. And frankly, neither does the engine manufacturer. This is how it is. If you violate this and you don't do exactly what I'm telling you, then you have to run, uh, I will have to run a manual regen on it using a laptop, which means you're coming to see me on the hook. Now, don't bitch me out. Save your hate mail. I didn't make it. I'm just telling you how it works. Another big thing that is a myth is the little on-off switch, okay? A lot of times those trucks will have a three-position rocker, a start, a middle, and an off. 
Now, guys, we're getting in these trucks at first and going, I don't need none of the mission shit. I'll just flip the switch and shut it off. Big shock. That's not how it works. The whole point of having that off switch is this. This is why uh, most of you line haul guys or dump truck drivers, you, you guys don't need that shit. The reason that off switch is in there is for safety. Example, let's say you're pulling a tractor and you haul gasoline and you are at a refinery getting filled or you are uh, pumping a shit into a tank in the ground. That is a bad time for that truck to be putting out 12 to 1500 degree exhaust heat, ain't it? So when you go to pull into the chemical plant or you go to pump or whatever, reach over, flip the switch off. Um, if you're driving a grain truck and you're getting loaded in the middle of a fucking wheat field in a drought, bad time to be putting out high temperature exhaust. Reach over, flip the switch off. But as soon as uh, you get out back out of that situation, you need to flip that switch back to the center position. You do not need to run a regen unless the truck says regen required. That little idiot light starts flashing. That's another big thing. Guys will say, I hit the button and it won't regen. Now they're set up that they won't. They will not regen unless the truck tells you it wants to regen. Another big thing with DPFs is uh, a lot of guys will be going down the road and they'll say, oh, my high exhaust temperature light came on. It looks like an explanation point or like a therm it looks like a thermometer, I, I rephrase that. It looks like a thermometer with a little cloud around it. It's been coming on all day or it came on once or whatever. What that is telling you is that truck is doing one of those passive regen things where it might even be doing an active, but you don't know about it, okay? If the truck is not informing you, all it's telling you is warning your exhaust temperature is high. What that means is that truck's doing a regen without informing you that it's doing a regen. If you're going down the road, the light comes on, then it goes off, no big deal. It means it did it, it did its thing all by itself, created this heat, burned all the shit out of the soap box, out of the soap box DPF, whatever the fuck you want to call it, and everything's fine. When that light is coming on and going off all day long, what that means, the truck is not broke. Okay, so you don't need to come see me yet. When that light is coming on and going off, what that is telling you is, is it keeps trying to do that, and it's getting up to temperature, but conditions aren't right for it to complete its cycle. So what's happening is it's getting up to heat, and then like you start pulling a hill, engine load gets too high, it can't do it. Or um, all of a sudden you stop and you're at idle, or just whatever the, whatever it is. There's so much shit that can, that can vary this. Changes in engine load, changes in vehicle speed, all kinds of things that it will not do it on its own. So when that light is coming on and going off all day, that just means all day long it's trying to do a regen. By the end of the day, it might ask you to do a regen, okay? Which case, you pull the button, you hit it, you pull your uh, pull your big yellow button out, hold the button, let it do a regen. Number one failure I see in DPFs, and the biggest problems that we have with them, number one, people do not clean them. Like, 4,500 hours, 250,000 miles, they have to come out. Oh, well, no, I was told don't give a fuck. Whoever told you that is wrong. It's 200 to 250, and it's 4,000 to 4,500. They need to be cleaned. And then usually you get nine to 10,000 hours out of them, and then they're junk. They cannot always be cleaned. You got to remember, as that thing fills up with soot, then it regens. And it fills up with soot, then it regens. And it fills up with soot, then it regens. Then we take it out and we clean it. It fills up with soot in the region. It fills up with soot in the region. Then we take it out and then we clean it. You can only recover so much out of it, and then eventually the thing's just fucking junk, and they need to be replaced. Lack of maintenance is one. Number two uh, is that the HC or the fuel doser or the after treatment injector, whatever you want to call it if you have one, that's, that usually plugs over with soot because um, there's always a little dribble of fuel that catches soot and turns into concrete, and it will not let fuel inject down into the system. The biggest thing that nobody ever catches, and I have watched, and I'm not saying I'm the best mechanic, not by any means am I, uh, but I've watched guys chase this for weeks and never find it. Plugged air filter. It needs air. When that thing ramps up to go through a regen, it needs air, pure oxygen, to be able to make its way down in there. Well, if your air filter uh, looks like a science project, you ain't getting nothing down in there. Now, when you bring your truck to me and it won't regen, and I tell you, you need two $100 filters, don't argue with me. I don't care when the last, I don't care if you had them. The guys at the TA just checked them. First of all, when you come to a dealer or distributor, we don't give a fuck what the TA told you, okay? Believe me, we really couldn't care. I wouldn't care what Petro told you anything. And I'm not knocking any of the guys who work there. It's a great starter job, great way to get experience. They are not engine guys, okay? That is not their purpose. When you come up to the dealer or distributor level, uh, those are the guys that you, when we tell you, your filter's fucked. You need a filter. You're going to sit there, you'll pay a $900 record bill, but you'll bitch when I tell you it's because of a fucking, a lot of times it's one truck with one $70 air filter and you'll bitch that you don't want to change it. 
Next one is fuel pressure. Change your fucking fuel filters, okay? Maintenance, 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 maintenance. It's more critical now than it has ever been because now there's things watching it. Um, there, are, there are givens. Um, fuel filter restriction, air filter flow, uh, exhaust flow. This stuff is all, it all has an expected value. They don't actually monitor a lot of this stuff. Um, the engine doesn't monitor it. That's your job to monitor. It uses like your air filter flow as a given. Like the air filter should be flowing this much. Well, guess what? It's not. Shit's all fucked up. The big thing with the air filter too is that when the air filter is plugged, the engine is actually putting out more soot than normal because there's not as much air to burn as much fuel. It's going to plug your DPF even faster. Air filter, air filter, air filter. Just fucking change them. Next thing, SCR. SCR stands for Selective Catalytic Reduction. Now, if you're trying to find your SCR on your truck, it goes like this. It goes engine, then DPF and DOC if your truck is equipped with a DOC, then the SCR. The SCR is the last thing that you see in the whole ball of wax before it comes out the tailpipe. Okay, so what is the SCR? What is its point and how does it make its point? How it does what it does, we are going to skip over very fast because I do not have time to get into advanced chemistry with you people. Uh, I'll put it to you in this way, similar to the way a catalytic converter works on a car is almost how an SCR works, uh, it just has a different effect. Uh, there are plates made of indifferent metals inside of the SCR and uh, with heat and ammonia, uh, it gives you a desired effect and that desired effect is it reduces NOx gas, it reduces uh, CO, it reduces hydrocarbons coming out of the exhaust, it does actually a lot of different things. The reason that we have SCR on trucks is because uh, instead of fixing the actual problem, which is the dinosaur underneath the hood burning dinosaur juice, um, they decided to clean up the aftermath of it. They decided that they can't make engines do what they want uh, to get the desired tailpipe emissions, so they created this bullshit, and what this does is this creates the desired uh, tailpipe emissions, supposedly, when it works. So back to the how does it work. If you have an SCR on your truck, you're going to use diesel exhaust fluid, or if you have a diesel exhaust fluid, you have an SCR. SCR is what uses the, the DEF, or diesel exhaust fluid. Um, P.S. Stop saying DEF fluid, because you're saying diesel exhaust fluid fluid, which is just fucking dumb. DEF is a mixture of 67.5% uh, distilled deionized water and 32.5% urea solution. Uh, uh, what it does is somewhere between the uh, DPF and SCR, there's going to be this thing called a decomposition tube. Big fancy word for an exhaust pipe with a French fry cutter stuck in it with an injection port. That is where you will loc you, that's where you will find your DEF doser mounted. Now what happens is when conditions are right and the SCR gets up to temperature, it will start dosing DEF through the decomposition tube which will go through the french fry cutter or diffuser plate or whatever the fuck you want to call it and make its way into the SCR. So now atomized DEF ends up going through and it ends up mixing with the exhaust gases, all the bad shit that's in there, all the evil things according to the penguin huggers like NOx and things like that. And then when all this shit ends up going through those in different metals at the same time, it causes a chemical reaction. And uh, again, I can't get into advanced chemistry with you people, but the fast version is, is you know, uh, you take one thing and you, you add it to another thing, you get something completely different uh, with a little bit of motivation. And that's basically what it's doing. It is taking uh, ammonia, which the urea solution, the point of that is it is just a very stabilized form of ammonia. Uh, and it breaks it down uh, and it combines with the exhaust gases and unicorn farts end up coming out of your tailpipe. Does it actually work? Yes, it does. Uh, like I said, I've been around this industry literally my entire life. And what I can tell you is, is when these trucks now, I mean, we can leave them running in the shop for hours and no problems. I mean, we bring an old mechanical in and then within five minutes, you can't see across the shop. So yes, all this shit actually does work. The biggest problems that we see with uh, the SCR, uh, well, there's a couple things. Uh, the first thing um, is the, actually the biggest problem is really when uh, you have like a base engine fault. Uh, if you've got a stuck EGR valve, something like that, 
uh, that will cause a downstream reaction. Uh, if you have a knock sensor failure, things like that, that's a pretty common thing. Uh, there are sensors mounted right behind your turbo and at your tailpipe that monitor the NOx output of the engine and then see how good the SCR can recover that and what's actually coming out of the tailpipe. Those sensors go bad all the time. That's a big one. Uh, we had a huge problem. Uh, everyone in the industry did. The DEF will freeze. At 12 degrees Fahrenheit, DEF turns to ice. I mean, a solid block. Um, so there are heaters uh, in the tank. There are heaters in the pump module. There are heaters in the lines. But those heaters do not work when the truck is not running. So if you live in an extremely cold climate, um, you've probably had a DEF pump failure. What happens is the DEF inside the pumps will freeze. They're made out of Taiwanese plastic, so they fucking break. Also, they had a big problem. It took them forever to figure out the heated lines. It looks like now uh, most of the manufacturers have conquered it. After about 30 updates or so, uh, or changes to the DEF lines, uh, the heater elements in them would just take a shit. Now it seems like they've got those figured out, and they're lasting quite a bit longer now, so that doesn't seem to be as big of a problem. Uh, if you live in the north, you really don't have to worry about this. Uh, <laughs> there's, I, I, they wouldn't like to hear me say that, but it's true. Uh, the DEF filter, there is a filter inside that pump module. As far as I know, every single one of them has it. Um, you need to change that filter if you do not live in the north. I say in the north, you do not need it because usually the pumps freeze and break before the filter gets a chance to plug. Check with your OEM and follow their guidelines. Maintenance, 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 maintenance. Another huge problem that we have with them uh, is shitty DEF. Now, people don't like to hear what I'm about to tell you, okay, but I'm not here to uh, blow sunshine up your ass. I'm here to tell you the truth. Uh, I did an independent redneck survey. Uh, I took three truck drivers with three identical trucks with three identical loads running for the same company, Depot to Depot, okay? And I gave them all notebooks, and I did my own homework on this, and this is a proven fact. If you go and you buy the DEF out of the jugs inside the truck stop, you know, the shit that costs like $2 more for a jug than what you're going to save using the bulk pump, you will use less than half of the DEF that you will using the bulk shit. Why? Well, that's pretty simplistic. You got to remember, I just told you, it's 67.5% water, and it is 32.5% urea solution. You are allowed a 1.5% deviation off of that. If you exceed that, you're coming to see me. Well, what you don't realize is salt, urea, uh, whatever, ammonia, does not really evaporate, okay? Uh, that's why if you dump DEF on the ground, you end up with this big salt stain, the water evaporates out of it. Well, these big, huge, giant tanks that are out in the sun with nothing in them to agitate them, nothing like that, what happens to them? The mixture is not kept, uh, it, it's not like that homeostasic fucking uh, balance, you know what I mean? Uh, in the jugs, even if the water evaporates, it can't leave it because it's stuck in the jug. You shake the jug before you dump it in the truck, and you're guaranteed to have the perfect mixture. So, if you know that it's a dollar more, you will actually end up saving money by buying this shit in the jugs. I'm telling you, do a survey for yourself. What do you got to lose? You're going to lose 50... Now, you might lose 100 bucks on a coast-to-coast -coast run, but if I'm right... Another thing, if you refuse to do that, if you're too cheap to do that, you're too cheap to do this. But I think every truck should do this. Every, every guy who has DEF should do this. Go buy what's called a DEF refractometer. They're like 50 to 80 bucks or whatever. You could probably call your local distributor, buy one online, whatever. DEF refractometer. And what it does is you put a drop of the DEF on there and you hold it up to the light and it'll tell you your concentrate level. This could save you a toll bill. And every time you go to pump that shit in, because you're not going to buy the shit in jugs like I told you, just take the pump handle and put a squirt right on that thing and hold it up and see if it's any good coming out of there. If it's not, then go buy the shit in the jugs. If it's dead nuts, pump away. Big problem we see with DEF, uh, with the entire system, is people come in and now uh, all these trucks have smart gauges with the little idiot lights inside the gauges. They'll say, well, my tank is full, but the idiot fucking light saying that it's empty is flashing. That means you have an emissions-related fault in the SCR system. Come see me. I'll let you guys in a little insider information. This is kind of funny. Um, the SCR does the exact does pretty close the same thing as EGR. Okay, the whole point, the gas that they always go after is NOx, because NOx, as I said, destroys the environment worse than anything else. Now, EGR gets rid of NOx, SCR gets rid of NOx. Now, if any of you have heard of the International Max Force Engines, or all the problems plagued that it's plagued by, comes down to the simple fact. They did not want to use SCR, so they figured if they just porked the living shit out of that engine with EGR, they could lower the NOx enough that they would need to run SCR. Now, if you have an SCR-related fault, You'll be de if you drive it long enough, you'll be derated to five miles an hour. Do you know why? 
because International went and bitched to the EPA saying, well, the system's too easy to bypass and we need to put all these things in play. So they came up with this idea of uh, the DEFD rate and they shut you down and you'll be limited to five miles an hour if you drive a heavy truck for long enough uh, with your check engine light on, your DEF light flashing, etc. Now, the really funny part is that International System uh, these people who cried and bitched about this, their system failed horribly. We all know the problems of the max force if you're in the heavy truck world. Guess who now has DEF on their trucks? International, because their great idea ended up backfiring. So now, uh, if you have an international and you are broke down at a five mile an hour D rate, you can only blame uh, yourself. <laughs> While I have all of your attention. There's a few trucking myths that I need to, from mechanic to non-mechanic, that we need to get out there. First of all, your average mechanic has spent at least 30 grand out of his own pocket uh, in training and probably 50 in tools. And the dealership or distributor he works at has probably spent another, you know, 10 to 50 on his education and on his training, okay? You are not going to help us Stay out of the shop. When you come out in the shop, all you're doing is creating a dangerous situation, pissing off the mechanic, and running up either your bill, your company's bill, or the engine manufacturer's bill, which just fucks everybody. Stay out of the shop. I don't give a fuck if it's your truck or not. I don't care how much money. No, you can't wait in the truck. That's dangerous, too, because when you start rocking around in it, you're going to throw the truck off a balance. You're gonna, we're going to fall the fuck off of it. Someone's going to get hurt, and you're going to go, oh, it wasn't my fucking fault. No, it is your fault. Stay out of the shop. I don't care if you own a truck. That's the same reason you ain't allowed in the operating room when they're operating on your kid. Okay? You're going to see a bunch of shit that you ain't going to like, and then it's going to give you something else to bitch about. Stay the fuck out of the shop. One of the most, one of the questions, I can't believe how much I get asked this, but you guys on the CV, somebody need to shut the fuck up. This is a common question that I get, believe us or not. What set of those pins under there and that little fancy connector you guys plug into which one of those pins do you cross to eliminate the top speed limiter? The answer is pretty much uh, any one of them. I uh, cross any two of those pins and it will eliminate your top speed limiter. It will completely take it out of the equation. Because once you do that, you will be limited to going as fast as the tow truck is programmed to go. Can I piss in my DEF tank? Yeah, I guess so if your aim is good enough. But if you're trying to, if you're suggesting simulating DEF with piss, it is not going to work. Your piss contains urea. It is not a 67.5% uh, deionized water and a 32.5% urea solution, okay? Uh, for the same things like Sunny Delight and Fireball and whatever the fuck that other one is, all have ethylene glycol in them, and people are like, oh, we're drinking fucking antifreeze. No, ethylene glycol is an ingredient in those. It is an ingredient in antifreeze. The ethylene glycol doesn't kill you in antifreeze. It's the rust inhibitors. If you piss in your diesel exhaust fluid tank, you will fuck the system up and nobody will work on that truck because as soon as they see there's piss in there, that's an unsanitary condition. We're not fixing it. Hey man, uh, I need some more power. If I throw you like 50 bucks, can you turn me up? No. What you don't realize is that there is no magic. It's not like setting your speed. I can't just go in there and, and change the number of it. It's not like I just erase the 400 and type in 650. There are calibration files that I need to download from the engine manufacturer that everybody's going to know about. They are very fucking expensive. There is no just magic thing. So again, if you'd stay the fuck out of the shop, you wouldn't be in that spot to begin with of having me bitch you out that I can't do that. Stop trying to give me cash to turn your truck up because it's not going to happen. Stop asking us to bypass things. No, I will not put hot codes in your 6NZ. No, I will not beat a pipe through your DPF. That shit is all a violation of federal law. And I'm not going to risk my job because you don't know how to downshift. Well, I got to have 500. You don't understand. I haul heavy. I got to have five and a quarter at least. There was a time in this country when real men drove trucks and they were excited when they got the new latest and greatest engine called a 290 Cummins. And if you don't notice, it was called a 290 because it had 290 horsepower. So you don't know how to shift. You don't know how to drive. You don't have any patience. This isn't my fucking problem. You don't need over 500 horse in a heavy truck. Oh, uh, well, I like Cummins because they ain't got all that bullshit on it.
Uh, every truck that I've seen uh, in in a very long time now has a common rail. All new trucks, they are common rail. They all have EGR. They all have DPFs. They all have SCR. They all have the same bullshit on them. You know, one last thing. It's always the guy that takes two fucking days to figure out how to program his fucking DVR that's going to bitch at me that it's taking me too long to fix his fucking truck. Look at with 10 computers, 67 miles of fucking wire, uh, doing control error and networks, all this crazy shit that's going on inside these trucks. Sometimes it takes time to find the fucking problem. Chill the fuck out. Shit happens. You're losing money. I get it. Build a 6NZ glider. I don't know what the fuck to tell you. Tough shit. Hope that cleared it up for you. Keep your children and your guns close. Save a hate mail. Because I don't give a fuck. P.S. If anyone argues with anything that I just told you, don't let them work on your truck.